as I said in the vlog video that just comes right um, before this one, I want to I'm going to do a, a couple little videos on some of the questions at the Jordan Peterson at Lafayette conversation. And because many of you probably haven't watched it, I'm first just going to record the question, and then I'm going to go back over it and make my comments. So here we go. First question: What is religion? Okay, so we're going to go to Alex and then Saeed. Yeah, so it's, it's going to distribute them. Thank you for being here. I really appreciate it. Um, so I was watching a few of your interviews in preparation for this, and I heard you speak about religion quite a bit. And if you look up what religion means in the Webster Dictionary, you get something like um, a system of faith centered on a supernatural being or beings or something like that. Mm -hmm. But I've heard you use religion to describe things like punk rockers, for example, that that's a religious experience. So my first question would be, how do you define what is considered religious. And then sort of as a follow-up to that, um, if, say, Sam religious Harris... Religious is what you act out. What's that? Religious is what you act out. Anything you act out. Everything you act out is, is predicated on your implicit axioms. And the system of implicit axioms that you hold as primary is your religious belief system. It doesn't matter whether you're an atheist or not. That's just surface... That's just surface noise. So it has nothing to do with divinity or no, supernatural beings? No. Or it doesn't necessarily have to do with those? No, it probably necessarily has to do with it too, but it doesn't necessarily have anything to do with your voluntarily articulated statements about whether or not you believe in something like a transcendent deity. So, I mean, what you act out is much more what you are than what you say about yourself. And what the hell do you know about what you believe anyways? You're complicated, man. It's a fair question. Well, seriously, people are complicated. You know, like we're, we don't, we're not transparent to ourselves at all. That's why we have, that's why we have to go to university and study psychology. It's like, you know, we're, we're, we're not exactly black boxes, but we are the most complicated things there are, right? And we can't even program our VCR clocks. So it's like, how the hell can we propose to understand ourselves? And you know, I'm existentially oriented, which is to say that I think that what you hold to be true is best determined as, an, as a consequence of an analysis of your actions rather than as a consequence of an analysis of what you purport to believe. Now, in order to act, you can't act without a, a hierarchy of value, which I tortured the other poor questioner about. You can't act without a hierarchy of values because you can't act unless you think one thing is better than another because why, why would you act otherwise? So that means that you're embedded within a hierarchy of values, whether you know it or not, or maybe multiple fragmentary and competing hierarchies of value, which is all the worse for you, by the way, because it just makes you very confused. That hierarchy of values has an axiomatic, it's, it's based on axioms, and the probability that you understand them is very low because generally people don't understand their axioms. But that axiomatic system is essentially your religious system. And there's, there's no way out of that, as far as I can tell. And you can say, well, it isn't predicated on conscious belief in a transcendent deity. It's like, okay, have it your way. But, you know, most people in this room act out a Judeo-Christian ethic. And not only do they act it out, if they're treated in a manner that's not commensurate with that ethic, they get very, very, very annoyed. So, for example, if I fail to treat you as if you're an embodiment of a divine fragment, let's say, that's characterized by the ability to, the ability to make free choice and to determine your own destiny in some sense, or if I fail to treat you as if you're a valued member, valued contributing member of the polity as a sovereign individual, then you'll find that very offensive and become angry. It's like, okay, then that's what you believe. Well, if I ask you if you believe any of that, well, that's a whole different story. You might give me some radical leftist nonsense, but that doesn't I take try away not to. from what you've, <laughs> that doesn't take away from the fundamentals of your action. As one final thing, so when you and, say, Sam Harris argue about religion, you're arguing about fundamentally different 
things, it sounds like. His conception of what is religious is very different from yours. Yeah, well, he How- tends to think of religious, religious thought the same way that a smart 13-year-old atheist thinks about a fundamentalist Christian. It's like, yeah, okay, that just, you're just not getting to the heart of the matter. You know, and I just finished reading all of Sam's books in the last couple of weeks. And as far as I'm concerned, he doesn't ever get to the bottom of the issue. He doesn't address the fundamental thinkers. There are some profound thinkers. Dostoevsky's one, Tolstoy, Nietzsche, Jung, it's like they're completely absent from, and the same with Dawkins, it's completely absent. All that conceptualization is completely absent from their corpus of works. They don't even have an understanding for the psychological utility of religion. And it's a big problem. You know, you, you don't get to be an atheist when the people you attack are fundament, like, like naive fundamentalists. And I have some, some sympathy for the naive fundamentalists. It's like what they're basically saying is something like this. Look, we have an ethos that's valuable. You scientist types are casually dismantling it. What the hell are we supposed to do? Well, the fundamentalists don't know what to do about that. So they say, well, creationism is science. It's like, well, no, it's not. But that doesn't mean that they don't have a point. Their point is there's something valuable here. It's like, don't break it casually. What are you going to replace it with? The new atheists wish wish that everybody becomes rational. It's like, yeah, sure, that's going to happen. (laughs) Thank you. Okay, let's uh, let's start at about 150. And I'll just add some comments as we go. I, I know it drives some of you crazy when I stop it, but the reason I stop it is because I'm stopping. Well, obviously, the reason I'm stopping is to add my own commentary. But the reason I don't feel bad about stopping it is I'm just using stuff that you can watch straight through. But in this case, you might not have watched the whole thing straight through. So there's the whole thing straight through. And now I'm going to run through it again. Add a little commentary. Okay, so we're going to go to Alex and then Saeed. Is going to distribute them. Now, again, as I mentioned in the blog, at this at this point, the um, the the kind of the attacks on him have kind of blown themselves out, and it's very interesting. Many of the students um, have sincere, some of them sympathetic questions. So, you know, to try to get a read on the room based on this narrow window of the of the video is is interesting. But Peterson, at this point, is quite a bit more relaxed, uh, although st- still a little nervous. Thank you for being here. I really appreciate it. Um, and I, I think it's also important to recognize that this is a university. So um, this is this is a this is a this is a situation he's used to being in. He's used to dealing with students. Students are people of a certain age, a certain background. Um, this is um, I assume this is is Lafayette in the United States. But um, yeah, so here we go. Question about religion. So I was watching a few of your interviews in preparation for this, and. I heard you speak about religion quite a bit, and if you look up what religion means in the Webster Dictionary, you get something like um, assist. I was going to get my water bottle. Um, uh, word, word to the young, dictionaries, eh, there's some use, not a lot, especially for a complicated thing. Them of faith centered on a supernatural being or beings or something like that. Mm-hmm. But I've heard you use religion to describe things like punk rockers, for example, that that's a religious experience. So my first question would be, how do you define what is considered religious? And then sort of as a follow-up to that, um, if, say, Sam religious Harris... Religious is what you act out. What's that? Religious is what you act out. Anything you act out. Everything you act out is is predicated on your implicit axioms. I wonder if the student understands what implicit axioms are, but you know, when I was when I was growing up, going to Christian school in New Jersey, um, our Bible teacher in who was a very conservative dude, I think it was Orth, um, OP, he was um, OPC, which is Orthodox Presbyterian Church, um, which is a is a very conservative um, denomination in the Reformed spectrum. You know, gave us pretty much the standard line within our sub tradition. All of life is religious. Um, we we act out our religions, and I think Peterson is dead on. 
it's um, it's not what you say, it's what you do. And this obviously comes to the American pragmatist, but it's it's been in Christianity a long, long time. And the system of implicit axioms that you hold as primary is your religious belief system. It doesn't matter whether you're an atheist or not. That's just surface. That's just surface noise. So it has nothing to do with divinity or no, supernatural beings. No. Or it doesn't necessarily have to do with those. No, it probably necessarily has to do with it too, but it doesn't. And, and that's an interesting move when he pauses and he thinks about it. And, and you know, this is, again, you know, some of what I've benefited from Jung in terms of recognizing, recognizing, recognizing how our, how porous we are. And this gets into some of, again, Charles, Taylor's ideas of the buffered self. Uh, we are we are not as buffered as we think. It doesn't necessarily have anything to do with your voluntarily articulated statements about whether or not you believe in something like a transcendent deity. So I mean, and and this this answer cuts both ways. And and this has been a a thing that I've thought a lot about in terms of the church. I think many of us in the church are way more secular than we would like to admit. Just like even hardcore atheists I know are way more um, have, have way more theism in them than definitely what they want to admit, and and this is part of what I'm trying to get at in terms of this this phrase a monarchical vision. This is this is so foundational to our entire perspective in the West that. Um, you know, and, and that's where Peterson's critique here is, you know, Sam Harris, yeah, he says he's, he's an atheist, but he acts like a Christian. Well, what do you mean by that? Well, well he acts like, and, and Peterson will, will go into this actually in a, in a later question where he'll deal with, you know, we're all socialized here. We all know the rules. We're, there's, a, there's a common narrative we're all working, and the postmodernists come and say, no, no, no common narrative is, no common narrative is legitimate. Well, then we're just then, spewed out into chaos but we can't act that way we can't live that way in other words practically we're smarter than our but then the stories we tell ourselves are I mean, what you act out is much more what you are than what you say about yourself and what the hell do you know about what you believe anyways you're <laughs> that's just classic peters complicated man it's a fair question well seriously people are complicated you know, like we're, we don't, we're not transparent to ourselves at all. That's why we have, that's why we have to go to university and study psychology. It's like, you know. And, and again, that we're not transparent to ourselves. This is, you know, this is Paul in Romans 7. This is, this is throughout the history of the West. We know we're not transparent to ourselves. Okay. How does, how does this figure into our system? And like, this is why we go to university, study psychology or study English or study history or study any of the humanities. We're, we're, we're not exactly black boxes, but we are the most complicated things there are. Right. And we can't even program our VCR clocks. <laughs> I wonder how many kids here have ever seen a VCR, but you know, Hey, well, I, hey, Dr. P I get that. I'm old like you. So it's like, how the hell can we propose to understand ourselves? And, you know, I'm existentially oriented, which is to say that I think that what you hold to be true is best determined as, an, as a consequence of an analysis of your actions rather than as a consequence of an analysis of what you purport to believe. And, and that's really important, too, because, again, who am I? Well, there's the me I experience myself as being. And, and in some ways, I know myself better than anyone else knows me because I have this one perspective. But those around me who, who know me well or know me a little, they all have insights into who I am that I am divorced from, that I am disassociated from, that I am, that I, that, that I am in fact in conflict with, even though they're true. And so that's where, you know, talking a lot about the resurrection because we're in the Easter season in the liturgical calendar. But but this is where if if there is a God that is going to resurrect me, that that God needs to have a monarchical vision. And, and that vision needs to include the me I know myself to be. It needs to include the, those around me who are close, who know me well. But But again, no one of these pictures is the whole me. 
And, and so then the question is, is there a whole me? And does that exist? And does that view of me exist? And I, I think when you try to piece together the kind of being that could actually have that view of me, you get God. Now, does that being actually exist? Well, then now we're getting kind of into the ontological, ontological argument. But this is, this, is, this is how we are. Now, in order to act, you can't act without a hierarchy of value, which I tortured the other poor questioner about. You can't act without a hierarchy of values because you can't act unless you think one thing is better than another. And, and this is where, when Peterson says of, of Sam Harris or many others, their hierarchy of values has a great deal of commonality with all of us around all of those around us, including those who have who profess theist beliefs. Okay, and and so then when we draw these hard lines, and, and you know, okay, as a pastor, I come from a confessional church. When we draw these hard lines on between people based on certain of these aspects, certain of these identities. Now that is a that is an important and functional thing that we do. And part of what churches do, for example, when they say, okay, you're going to be a member, you're going to be a professing member, which means you stand up and you make vows. Now, there's, there's worlds of things in that person that go beyond their professions, uh, professions of faith, worlds of ways they betray their vows, worlds of, of complexities, worlds of things they don't know. But, but the fact that we isolate that, those vows, and you do this in marriage, you isolate those vows. Um, Luce Meads, who was... Again, someone from the Christian Reformed Church eventually went on to taught at Calvin College and eventually went on to teach at, at Fuller Seminary. You know, he, he wrote a number of books on, on promises and basically said, you know, our promises define us and launch us into the future. You know, your dog doesn't make a promise. Your dog might act out obedience, but your dog doesn't make a promise. And this is where we get into the C.S. Lewis business about reason versus nature. And this is where we get into the logos but you know all of this kind of comes together but but you know we're we're enormously complex and so you have the you have reason and the logos and the promise and you have all that but you also have what you act out and how you are disassociated how you are divorced how you are separated how you are blind to all of this stuff underneath that you're actually acting out so then what actually do you believe that, that is not a simple thing to try to say cuz why why would you act otherwise so that means that you're embedded within a hierarchy of values, whether you know it or not, or maybe multiple fragmentary and competing hierarchies of value, which is all the worse for you, by the way. And, and that's exactly, you know, when you look at the American religious scene, and I'm working on my sermon for this week where I'm going to be talking about the resurrection. I'm going to be talking about what Americans believe about a bunch of different things. And, and this is the thing. Americans, sometimes we have a, you know, we have a salad bar Christianity where we say, oh, OK, here's a dish and I'm going to take fragments of all these things. and I'm going to put them in a plate and that's going to be my worldview. That's going to be my religion. That's going to be authentically me. And so we've taken on this value in American society that says authenticity is what is unique to me. Well, OK, the difficulty you have is that that then does not become the basis for a community. Now, now people right away have difficulty when they come into a church because a church says, okay, we're going to have, we're going to ask you to believe these things. And you say, well, what if I don't? Okay, well, understand the interchange that is happening when we ask you to believe something. We're not saying that, you know, we sure would like it if you would authentically believe this. But for example, I as a minister, I am a, I'm an ordained minister of the word in the Christian form church, which means I signed something called the form of subscription. Now it's called the covenant of office bearers. And, and what that basically says is I subscribe to these beliefs. Now, what does that mean? Does that mean that they're, that they're fully integrated into my entire being? No, it means that I profess them and it means that I won't teach otherwise. Uh, and it, But it also understands that this is built into our system that if I've got thoughts and doubts and all of these things, that's normal and expected. And I, I will process that and I'll deal with that. And it's actually within that process of dealing with what the church tells me I should believe and, and this package that is constructed and has kind of grown up all around me, even full of all kinds of things that I don't understand or, or believe or think I believe and, and all of that mess. It's the process of working these two things together that actually I begin to sort out 
truth or hopefully begin to discover truth and sort out truth and get insight. Now, we're all little tiny human beings and none of us are saved by what we achieve. And therefore, you know, I'm going to get into this in my sermon a little bit. So my sermon and my videos always bleed into one another. But but this is the process. And so a lot of people are like, well, well, how does church fit into this? Church is asking me to believe a bunch of things. Yeah. Uh, but I don't believe these things. Yeah. So what do I do? Do I never join? No. What you do is say, this is, here's another definition of, rel of religion. This is the rule. This is what I am bound to. Now, I am going to manage my persona. I'm also going to manage my, again, we talked in the last video that what isn't in the persona, my shadow self. I'm going to manage these two things. And, and so actually, the development of my Christian life is the wrestling between the persona and the shadow and the attempt to integrate it. But my persona is not just some idea of what I think I would like to be. My persona is that the church speaks into it in terms of its confessions. And now when I say confessions, I mean doctrinal statements and doctrinal standards and professed beliefs. And, and so the church speaks into my persona, and especially as an ordained clergy, that those those um, confessions become part of your persona, but you still have your shadow self, and you're going to have to figure out how to put these two things together. Now, I know there's some unions out there that are going to watch this and are going to probably critique this this persona in the shadow. I don't. I haven't. I'm, I'm getting this from Peterson. Has he got it right? I can't tell you. So, if you got some commentary, go ahead and leave it in the comments. But, and but, what you do as a as a Christian then is you start to work these things together. And, and this is where, you know, people have asked about atheist Christians. And I, I totally get that statement because you say, on one hand, I'm an atheist. I, I, I don't believe. Now, that's a very, that, that may be a very common thing. But on the other hand, I want to believe. And so you begin to say, okay, what am, what's, what's the work I'm going to do to try to become this thing? Because in a sense, you know, again, Jamie Smith, who's a, Professor at Calvin College who's writing a lot of books lately. You know, you are what you love. That's a, one, one of the more um, middle brow books that he's written lately. Uh, you are what you love. And so it's, and Tim Keller has always said, you know, people become Christians because first they see something beautiful and they want to become Christians. And they might not believe this stuff, but, but so then they start, then you have in Christian talk to fake it till you make it. Well, that's in a sense the dynamic between the persona and the shadow, and, and you're trying to integrate them. So the church says, this is how you should behave. And on the other hand, you say, well, this is how I am. And, and then you start working that together. And and hopefully in a good church, there's going to be both enough structure and enough flexibility where you have the space to do the process to work on these things together. And, and part of the reason I think that the church is foundational for society right now is because so few people have the kinds of relational space where they can actually work on these things together, where they can, where they can get, where, where they have wise, sane people who Jordan, one of Jordan Peterson's rules. Make friends with people who want the best for you. Well, why join a church? Because, well, look for a good one first, because there's a lot of wacky churches out there. I certainly know that. But, but find a group of people who want the best for you, that have a sane that have a sane theological perspective that is attractive to you. And and then make friends with these people. And really, I mean, you can formally join a church, but the only way to get in is, you know, go to the potlucks, go out, take people out to lunch, uh, stay after church and, and do the small talk. Um, you know, if there's other mixers at church, and churches almost always have other mixers, you know, get into other people's lives, make friends. And it's it's in that it's in that situation within the body of Christ that we actually can begin to grow up into things that look beautiful to us. So yeah, here I get to preaching, and let's, let's see if I can finish this. Because it just makes you very confused. That hierarchy of values has an axiomatic, it's, it's based on axioms. And the probability that you understand them is very low, because generally people don't understand their axioms. Right. We, we inherit our axioms. We, um, we, we pick them up as we go along. But you need axioms to live. But that axiomatic system is essentially your religious system. Right. And there's, there's no way out of that, as far as I can tell. And you can say, well, it isn't predicated on conscious belief in a transcendent deity. It's like, okay, have it your way. But, you know, most people in this room act out a Judeo-Christian ethic. 
And not only do they act it out, if they're treated in a manner that's not commensurate with that ethic, they get very, very, very annoyed. So for example, if I fail to treat you as if you're an embodiment of a divine fragment, let's say. Now, now again, to the theologians watching, don't freak out when he uses the word divine as he uses it. And to the, the others out there who say, why are the theologians freaking out when he uses the word divine that way? Well, it's, it's because of the history of the Judeo-Christian religion and theology. Divine is a pretty guarded word. Um, we would say the image of God. That's characterized by the ability to the ability to make free choice and to determine your own destiny in some sense. Or if I fail to treat you as if you're a valued member, valued contributing member of the polity as a sovereign individual, then you'll find that very offensive and become angry. And and getting into some of my more philosophical videos when we're talking about materialism, this is one reason that uh, a non metaphysical reason that materialism will not win because we have no idea how to act it out when you listen to well this is the materialist picture of the of the world nobody can follow it and this is where thomas nagel is dead on right because thomas nagel basically looks at it and says you know what's the point of pushing that because you can't even act it out. You don't act as if your own profession is true. Now, this has obviously been a huge problem in the church. Churches don't act as if their own profession is true. Churches don't act as if the resurrection is true, as if the Bible is true. This is a constant problem in the church. But this isn't a problem that's unique to the church. The materialists have the exact same problem, and I think they, in fact, have it worse, because they don't act anything near like what their profession is. And we can't even conceive of what acting like that profession would be in terms of the conscious experience of the story that is ourselves. Their, their worldview is simply unworkable, but it's kind of adopted. And in my opinion, it's adopted because, as Thomas Nagel points out, they don't want there to be a God. Because if there is a God, then I have to... I have to live with that in my mind, and that is hard. And I'm a religious person. That is hard, because if you think it's easy to deal with people, and it isn't, think about dealing with God. So it's like, okay, then that's what you believe. Well, if I ask you if you believe any of that, well, that's a whole different story. You might give me some radical leftist nonsense. but. <laughs> That doesn't I take try away not to. from what you see. And there, so who's, who's this young kid? Probably kind of a fan. And there are other fans that pop up and ask questions. There's some good questions in this, in this thing. That doesn't take away from the fundamentals of your action. As one final thing, so when you and say Sam Harris argue about religion, you're arguing. And now he's going to make the point about Sam Harris, and you heard it before. And and I think Peterson is dead on right. So I don't want to have this be too long. So I'm going to cut it off now.